Hey folks, uh, Mr. Howard here for a read aloud of The Wanderer from my back deck here. It's sort of odd to read an Anglo-Saxon poem about civilization versus nature from the comfort of my back deck with my neighbor mowing a lawn in the background, but here we are. So uh, we're going to read The Wanderer. We're going to be looking at those themes, civilization versus nature, um, uh, Christianity versus paganism, uh, and exile. We're also going to be looking at the literary terms that I taught you uh, just earlier. Uh, oral tradition, alliteration, alliterative verse, say Shura and Kenning. So we'll make sure we hit all of those. And and also I'm going to try and go over um, the meaningful elements of this poem so that you understand them and they reach out to you. Uh, and hopefully, you know, it's it's a good experience. Uh, normally I'd be teaching it on the board and I've got a bunch of tricks that, that I can use to help you understand it. I don't really have a board to work with here, so I'm going to have to do a lot of it verbally. Uh, but hopefully, you know, you've, you've heard it once. This will be your second time hearing it, and this time I'll be going through it, modeling the kinds of things that you should be looking for and, and the ways that you should be understanding the literature as you read it. So um, one of the things I want to talk about with the poem first before we even get into reading it is the, the structure of the poem. If you've looked at the poem already, um, which you have, you'll discover that the poem is sort of bookended. Um, it starts out with this narrator, this narrative point of view, um, and then it goes down here to a quotation mark, and it's what's called a monologue. There's this enormous monologue where the speaker talks, and he keeps talking. You see at the end of each of these um, sort of poetic paragraphs, there's no end to the quotation, and the quotation, you know, just starts again. And so he's still talking. He never closes the quotation marks. He just keeps going. Um, and the quotation marks don't close until the second to last right here. Um, all the foundation of the earth shall fail. And then we go back to the narrator again. So we're bookended with this narration. Uh, and we've got this long monologue uh, from the wanderer himself. The wanderer, it says, is weary of exile. So the whole poem is told from the point of view of somebody who's been exiled. We don't know what he was exiled for, uh, but that, I think, adds to the experience. Uh, basically, just to give you a preface to help you understand the poem better, the idea is that the, the narrator, the person telling the story, is an exile. Uh, and, you know, as an exile, he's alone. He has no family. He has no clan, um, no one to call his own. And he is um, dying. He's an old man, and he's trying to impart his wisdom on, on you, the reader, before he goes. It would be analogous to say you're walking the streets of D.C. and there's an old homeless guy um, wearing camo, probably a Vietnam vet, on the verge of death, and he knows he's going to die within a couple of days. And so he comes and he starts talking to you to teach you the wisdom that he's gained throughout his entire life. That's sort of how this, this poem is framed. Um, and that's something, I think, to help you understand what it's about and connect with the theme of exile. So... They've done a good job of highlighting the alliteration for you in the first stanza, uh, but the alliteration, remember this is an alliterative verse, so you're going to see it throughout. Uh, if you had a chance to read the, or listen to the bonus material last week, it was this poem read in Anglo-Saxon. I think you can hear the alliteration better in Anglo-Saxon than you can in English. So um, let me just read it to you, and as I read, I'm going to stop and analyze, and we'll make some sense out of this. The Wanderer. Oft, oft is an old word for often, so I'm going to modify and modernize the language as I go through. Often to the wanderer weary of exile. See that space here? That's your seishura. Um, these are stable throughout the entire poem, um, and so you're supposed to read it. I'm going to read the first stanza like I would if I had a seishura in it. Off to the wanderer weary of exile cometh God's pity, compassionate love, though woefully toiling on wintry seas, with churning oar in the icy wave. Homeless and helpless, he fled from fate. Thus says the wanderer, mindful of misery, grievous disaster and death of kin. So you can hear the rhythm. This is why it's easy to remember for a poet, the, the combination of the alliteration and the seishura uh, make it memorable. So translation, often the wanderer who is weary of exile, God's pity comes to this guy. Um, he's been woefully toiling on wintry seas, so this guy works on a ship um, in the North Sea. You can picture him pulling an oar on a Viking ship. It's winter. It's miserable. Um, with the churning oar on the icy wave. Then we, we emphasize this guy's condition. He's homeless. He's helpless. He's running from fate, um, which seems out to get him. He's had a miserable life. And then it says... 
Thus says the wanderer, mindful of misery, grievous disaster, and death of kin. So the monologue that's about to start is what the wanderer says when he thinks about his misery, the disasters he's faced, and all the family members who have died. So he's thinking about the sorrow of his own life, and this is his speech about that sorrow. So now we have a quotation mark and we change voices. We go from a third person narrator to the wanderer himself. Often when the day broke, often at the dawning, lonely and wretched, I wailed my woe. No man is living, no comrade left to whom I dare fully unlock my heart. I have learned truly the mark of a man is keeping his counsel and locking his lips. Let him think what he will. For woe of heart withstands not fate. A failing spirit earns no help. Men eager for honor bury their sorrow deep in the breast. So here it is. We're already teaching lessons. Um, we get a sense that this guy's life is miserable. He wakes up at dawn. Uh, he's lonely. He's wretched. He wails as well. He wakes up crying. Um, he has no friends left, no comrade left to whom he dares fully unlock his heart. So he keeps his own thoughts, his own emotions locked up in his chest. Um, that's a metaphor, right? Your chest is not something that can be locked or unlocked. Your heart can't, you know, but he's, he's making this metaphorical statement. He says, I have learned truly the mark of a man is keeping his counsel and locking his lips. Let him think what he will. So here's your first lesson. Think what you want to think, but don't tell people what you're thinking. People don't need to know. Um, think before you speak, you know, let, let you can think whatever you want, but don't say it. Uh, because people judge you for what you say, and if you keep it inside your head, nobody can judge you about that. Um, and then he says, woe of heart withstands not fate, a uh, failing spirit earns no help, and men eager for honor bury their sorrow in deep in the breast. The idea is don't be a whiner. Don't complain. When things are bad, don't be telling people how bad they are all the time. People stop listening. They stop caring, especially if you're in exile. So he continues, next stanza. So have I also, often in wretchedness, fettered my feelings. Fettered is a good vocab word for you. That's an old word for chains. Uh, so he's chained up his feelings, far from my kin. Kin is um, family. Uh, homeless and hapless since the days of old, when the dark earth covered my dear Lord's face, and I sailed away with a sorrowful heart over wintry seas, Seeking a gold friend, there's a kenning very clearly, um, if far or near lived one to sustain me with gift in the mead hall, another kenning for you, um, and comfort for grief. So this is stanza is about sort of how he became an exile. Um, he's had to chain up his feelings since the old days when the dark earth covered his dear Lord's face. So on a literal level, it sounds like he was a the last surviving member of a clan or a family and his lord died and he's the one who buried him so maybe they all died in battle and he's the only survivor and you get this image of him shoveling the dirt onto his lord's face um but on an allegorical level or a secondary level we talked about um exile i mean this guy's clearly in exile but we maybe we're dealing with earthly exile here maybe the dear lord is god and the dark earth is him coming down to earth and living his earthly exile in anglo-saxon terms it can mean both at the same time and i think that's certainly something maybe that's going on here um and he sailed away with a sorrowful heart over wintry seas um winter in this poem i think represents more than just winter i think it's a symbol um you know, he says how many winters he's he's seen. Winter represents not just, you know, the season winter, but hardship, difficulty, sorrow, death. I mean, this is pretty typical. Uh, as, as human beings, we love to equate the seasons with the life cycle, like birth is spring and summer is uh, maturity and fall is old age and winter is death. That's gone back since we were, you know, our earliest poems, our earliest writings, this connection of the seasons with our own life cycle. And that's coming on here. But I think winter, it's the hardest time if you're in Northern Europe. It's the most difficult time. And so saying, um, you know, he, he's going through winter probably also equates to going through hardship. Also, if you're, if you're paying attention to the Anglo-Saxon um, Christianity versus paganism lecture, um, you know, in, in uh, Christian religions, hell is associated with fire and heat. But in pagan religion, um, especially Northern Germanic paganism, hell is associated with ice and cold. And so winter is probably a hellish image as well. Um, anyway, where was I? Next stanza, line um, 26. Who bears it? This is a uh, 
question, a rhetorical question. Who bears it knows what a bitter companion shoulder to shoulder sorrow can be when friends are no more. His fortune is exile, not gifts of fine gold, a heart that is frozen, earth's pleasantness dead. And he dreams of the hallmen, the dealing of treasure, the days of his youth, when his lord bade welcome to wassail. There's a good vocab word for you and feast but gone is the gladness and never again shall come the loved counsel of comrade and king so again it's another reiteration of what he said already but there's some powerful stuff in here too the only companion he has left shoulder to shoulder is sorrow so he doesn't have any friends but the one person who never leaves him is his sadness it's always with him um his heart is frozen so we have more of that hell imagery um and he, he has dreams. He dreams of the people he used to know, the hall men, another Kenning, um, and his lord and the feasts they used to have. But that gladness, that happiness is gone, and he's never going to see his lord again. He's never going to see his friends again because they're dead and he's alone um, or because he's exiled and he can't go back. Whatever the case, um, he's clearly showing that. Um, line 35. Even in slumber his sorrows assail him, and dreaming he clasps his dear lord again, head on knee, hand on knee, loyally laying, pledging his liege, as in days long past. Then from his slumber he starts, lonely-hearted, another kenning, beholding gray stretches of tossing sea, sea birds bathing with wings outspread, while hailstorms darken and driving snow. Bitterer then is the bane of his wretchedness, the longing for loved ones, his grief is renewed. The forms of his kinsmen take shape in the silence. In rapture he greets them, in gladness he scans old comrades remembered, but they melt into air with no word of greeting to gladden his heart. Then again surges his sorrow upon him, and grimly he spurs his weary spirit chest. That's a kenning for like your, your soul. Once more, your body is a chest containing your spirit. Once more to the toil of the tossing sea. So this is another representation of, of how he feels like he wakes up in the morning and he dreams. The only place that he can see his family, the only place that he can see the places and the people that he loves are in his dreams. And he greets them and he loves them and he's very happy to see them. But then when he wakes up, it all vanishes and all he sees is the toil of the tossing sea. Um, it would be like, you know, this, this war veteran metaphor that we're going for. Imagine like the people that died, you see them in your dreams and then you wake up and they're gone and um, you're never going to get them back. And that's, that's the harshness of dealing with loss. But when you remember the, the, you know, average age for an Anglo-Saxon to live was 27 years of age. Um, death is a, is a part of their life. And this old man has lived and seen a lot. And now he's, he's alone. And I think we're underscoring that fact a number of times. Um, all right, where was I? Grimly, he, oops, I just lost my spot. Um, okay. Uh, no wonder, therefore, line 52. No wonder, therefore, in all the world, if a shadow darkens upon my soul, when I reflect on the fates of men, how one by one proud warriors vanish from the halls that knew them, and day by day all this earth ages and droops unto death. So we're looking at a theme of mortality here, right? Like um, this poem is what's called an elegy. It's a poem about death. It's a poem about uh, the shortness of life. And he thinks about all the men he's known, proud warriors, strong, and they're all dead. They vanished from the halls that knew them. And then the earth too is is fading to death, right? This idea that, that the world is getting worse and worse, the Anglo-Saxon outlook on civilization versus nature, that the golden age is gone and that the world is, is moving closer to its demise, to Armageddon or, or whatever, if you will. Um, so now here come some life lessons. This, this poem is designed to teach important life lessons, and uh, they're going to come thick and fast at this point. Um, no man may know wisdom till many a winter has been his portion. There's winter again representing hardship, um, not just age. So you can't be wise until you're old, but you can't be wise until you've faced hardship as well. And I think that's an interesting idea. Maybe it still holds up. This idea that, that the difficult times that we go through are the times that give us wisdom um, and understanding. Certainly reading your narratives um, shows that to be true. So no man may know wisdom till many a winter has been his portion. A wise man is patient, not swift to anger, nor hasty of speech. 
think before you speak. Be patient and wait. Y'all know impatient people. Apparently in Anglo-Saxon times, if you wanted to be an honorable person, you had to be patient. People didn't like impatient people. And I think that's still true. Human beings are still the same in a lot of ways as they were 1,500 years ago. Um, also, people who fly off the handle and get angry very easily and have a temper, it's better to be even keeled and not be angry all the time. Neither too weak nor too reckless in war, neither fearful nor fervent. Uh, so the guy says, and this is a warrior society, and I think this is interesting. He says you shouldn't be um, a coward. You shouldn't be too weak. But you also shouldn't be so brave that you're the first one to charge down a hill, the first one to look for conflict, because that person always dies. So um, you don't want to be too weak nor too reckless in war, um, nor too wishful of wealth. Don't be greedy. Nobody likes people who are greedy. Nor too eager in vow ere he know the event. I think that one's too true as well. He says, hey, if you want to be respected, don't be making promises that you can't keep. Always be sure you keep your promises. And this is especially true in Anglo-Saxon culture. The more of these poems you read, the more you see this as a central lesson. The idea is if, if you say you're going to do something and then you don't do it, that's always your fault. So in, in modern terms, if I say I'm going to go somewhere and then my car breaks down, and I don't get there, that's on me. That's not on my car. There's no extenuating circumstance. If I say I'm going to do something, I have to do it or else I'm a liar. Uh, so don't make a vow unless you know how it's going to turn out. And as a, as a teacher, I got to say, I walk down the halls in the school all the time and there's all these guys like leaning on a locker next to a girl who's like, I'm going to love you forever, baby. And I'm like, are you serious? Forever is a long time. What is it really going to be? Two months? Um, you know, so before you make some sort of crazy vow, think about it. Are you going to live up to those words? Um, a brave man must bide when he speaks his boast until he knows surely the goal of his spirit. That's an interesting lesson, too. Um, if you want to be considered brave, uh, then don't brag unless you will back it up. Anglo-Saxon culture is full of bragging. It's, it's something of a, um, a pastime and something that, that people enjoy. When you read Beowulf, bragging is, is the thing people do. But it's, it's like a wide receiver culture in football. You can't brag that you're going to light somebody up, that you're going to burn them, that you're going to score all these touchdowns and I'll not catch a single pass. Um, then you're a laughing stock. So you have to back up your brags no matter what it is. And so don't brag about things you can't do. Know your capabilities. Um, it's fine to brag as long as you back it up. Um, Next, uh, line 66, a wise man will ponder how dread is that doom. All this world's wealth shall be scattered and waste as now over all through the regions of earth. Uh, so he says a wise man will ponder, you know, that you can't take your money with you, that everything is temporary and everything you have on earth doesn't last. You know, that's that's a powerful statement, too. If you want to be wise, you have to realize that you're only here for a short period of time. Uh, and and adjust your priorities um, accordingly. Anyway, um, now we get a civilization versus nature section where uh, it's almost like we've shifted perspectives. He was on a boat, right? He was on a boat in the ocean. And now we get this image of an old wall. He's standing in the ruins of a Roman civilization. Um, and we can we can talk about that. But, you know, is this is he is he pondering the Romans and their demise. I mean, he, this is a British poem uh, and England was a Roman province. So maybe this poet's now standing in a, in a ruined Roman town, looking at it and thinking about who used to live there and, and how great they were um, and all the technology they had that is no more. Uh, I think that's clearly sort of what's going on here. But let me keep reading. Wall stand rhyme covered. Rhyme, by the way, is if you've ever been to the ocean, it's that salty goo that sort of icy salt that sticks to things. Walls stand rhyme covered and swept by the winds. The battlements crumble. The wine halls decay. Joyless and silent, the heroes are sleeping where the proud host, host is an old word for army, fell by the wall they defended. Um, we're going to pause there. Um, wine halls. They call them wine halls. I think we're talking about the Romans. They didn't have wine um, in Northern Europe. So to not say mead halls, to say wine halls, we're talking about older people. We're talking about stone buildings. They're crumbling. They're falling apart. Um, and now we get an image of what happens to each of these guys who died maybe here. Um, let's see. One, a bird bore over the billowing sea. Wait, I skipped something. Uh, some battle launched on their long last journey. One, a bird bore over the billowing sea. One, the gray wolf slew. One, a grieving earl sadly gave to the grave's embrace. 
Okay, so the Graves embrace is a creepy personification, by the way. The idea that the, the grave is hugging somebody who's been placed into it, um, that's disturbing. But let's go through this. These are illusions. These are pagan illusions. Um, a bird bore one over the billowing seas at the Valkyries, taking the souls of the slain up to Valhalla. Um, one the gray wolf slew is that Fenrir. Is this like a a allusion to uh, Ragnarok, or is that gray wolf like a reference to Odin? Um, one a grieving earl sadly gave to the grave's embrace. Hey, that goes right back to the Lord comment at the beginning. Is he remembering him burying his lord? Um, maybe. The warden of men has wasted this world till the sound of music and revel is stilled, and these giant built structures stand empty of life. The warden of men's a kenning. We capitalized warden. What's a warden? He's a guy who rules over a jail. Who is the warden of men then? That's a kenning for God. And I think it says something about Anglo Saxon culture that they look at God as a warden and earth as a jail. The warden of men has wasted this world. Great alliteration there, by the way. Um, until the sound of music and revel is still, there's no more, there's no more singing. There's no more poetry. This place was a place, this ruin was a place that was full of humanity, full of people living and breathing and singing and joy. And it's silent now. All you've got is the wind and the cold. Um, and these giant built structures stand empty of life. Uh, giant built is a kenning. Um, actually some of the Anglo-Saxons thought that the Romans must have been giants because they had no way to move these boulders into places that they were how did the boulder get put four stories up on a giant building uh, stone block that big while they had to be giants they didn't understand mechanical advantage and levers and things like that so um, that's a that's a kenning for Roman Roman built stuff and that's going to be important later uh, so we get this image of of what had been and you know imagine yourself in a, in a post-apocalyptic world if apocalypse happened and um, you're you know three or four generations removed from it and you don't have any written history and you walk into the ruins of New York City and you think to yourself, who used to live there? How many people? How great was the civilization that was here before us? Like, that's what this guy's looking at. That's what this guy's thinking about. Um, and he continues, uh, line 80. Uh, this is still a monologue. He's still talking to you as, as a reader. He who shall muse, it means think, he who shall muse on these moldering ruins and deeply ponder this darkling life must brood on old legends of battle and bloodshed and heavy the mood that troubles his heart. Where now is the warrior? Where is the war horse? The bestowal of treasure and the sharing of feasts? These are rhetorical questions. They're all dead. They're all gone. None of these people remain. Where's the warrior? Dead. And the horse is dead too. Nobody's sharing treasure here. Nobody's having a feast. Alas, the bright ale cup, the armor clad warrior, the king in his splendor. Those days are long sped in the night of the past as if they never had been. And that's a simile using as, but the idea here is sort of a metaphorical way to think about the world. All of this is sped into the night of the past. It's like, Today is sunny and bright, and the sun is going to set over the horizon, and, and as time moves forward, we set over the horizon, we vanish, we disappear like we never had been. If you didn't have writing, um, if you didn't have a way to record your deeds and who you were uh, when, when you died, you'd be gone forever. I mean, people built the pyramids, but who built them? We know, we know the pharaoh. What about the people? What about their lives? Um, the only memorial we have left is a stonework, and that's the same of the Romans. He's looking at this Roman town. Who lived here? Who were they? Those people are gone as if they'd never existed at all. We don't know who they were or what they believed or what they thought in or who they loved. It's, it's, they're, just, they're just gone. They're vanished into the night of the past as if they never had been. And now remains only for Warrior's Memorial. A wall, wondrous high, with serpent shapes carved. Storms of ash spears have smitten the earls, carnage of weapon and conquering fate. Storms now batter these ramparts of stone. Blowing snow and the blast of winter enfold the earth. Night shadows fall, darkly lowering from the north, driving raging hail in wrath upon men. That's a personification. Um, wretchedness fills the realm of earth, and fate's decrees transform the world. So there's a harsh civilization versus nature. Um, civilization's gone. All that's left is the ruins of its, its once great um, city. And the, the snow is coming in, smashing the walls, driving raging hail against men. I mean, this is, this is rough stuff. Now look at line 100. 
that cicada is pretty loud. Um, let, look at line 100 here. Um, here wealth is fleeting. The word fleeting means fading. It doesn't last. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Here wealth is fleeting. Friends are fleeting. Man is fleeting. Kinsman is fleeting. All the foundation of earth shall fail. And that's the end of his monologue. He says, money doesn't last. Friends, they don't last. You, you don't last. Humanity doesn't last. Family, it doesn't last. Everything that's founded on earth, everything that's built here on this earth is destined to fail. It's destined to fade. It's not permanent. And that connects directly to your uh, Christianity versus paganism and civilization versus nature themes, right? Like the idea that, that the earth is impermanent, that we've lost our struggle for dominance here on earth because we're all temporary. Our, our physical beings are temporary. Our money it's temporary. Our friendships, that's a little harder to believe, are temporary, but that's true. When somebody dies, you know, that's that's how it is. Kinship is fleeting. I, I don't know if that's the best translation there. Um, I've seen it translated as love in different versions of the poem, that love is fleeting. Um, you know, we always want to say love is forever, but how long does it last until one person or the other is gone, uh, until both are gone? Um, everything here is is temporary, he says. And that's how he ends the thing. He's like, boom, I'm done with my speech. Remember that everything is temporary. That's pretty bleak, that outlook. But we're not done. The poem, the poem continues on here. And um, I'll try and hit that, that last little bit. Hopefully you can hear over that cicada in my willow tree. Woo! Um, the last little bit is the bookend. We got the second half. It says, thus spoke the sage in solitude pondering. And we have a, another lesson. Good man is he who guards his faith. He must never too quickly unburden his breast of its sorrows, but eagerly strive for amends. And happy the man who seeks for mercy from the Father in heavens, our fortress and strength. So a couple of things in the last little paragraph here before we close this off. Um, Thus spoke the man, the sage, in solitude pondering. Uh, this whole thing that he's told you, it turns out he was only telling himself. He was in solitude and he was thinking all of these thoughts and he never said them at all. Why? Well, if you go back to the first lesson, it's that nobody likes a whiner. You know, so in, in this in this sort of metaphorical, you know, thing that I set up, uh, you go to you go to D.C. and this old Vietnam veteran approaches you to tell you the lessons and he stares at you and he thinks all of these things in his head. But he remembers that nobody likes a whiner and nobody wants to be told what to believe and that. A wise man is somebody who keeps his counsel, and so instead of saying anything, he thinks them all and walks away and doesn't impart his wisdom at all um, because nobody wants to hear it. And so he thinks these things, and they're only between him and God, and that's it, and they sort of die with him. Um, as, a, as a writer, it's a neat little trick to be able to say all of these things, but at the end be like, no, they weren't said. Uh, it's sort of like having your cake and eating it too, uh, but I think it's fascinating. Uh, so thus spoke the sage in solitude pondering. But then the lesson, um, a good man guards his faith and never too quickly unburdens his breast of its sorrow, but strives for amends to make peace with God, right? And at the end it says, a man is happy who seeks for mercy from his father in heaven, our fortress and strength. And so I think it's important that we have this, this contrast, this juxtaposition at the end of the poem, where um, everything that you have on earth will fail. Uh, wealth is fleeting, friends are fleeting, man is fleeting, um, kinsmen are fleeting. Everything that you have here, it's not going to last. But we have a fortress and strength which is going to last. And according to the poet, that fortress and strength is heaven and God. And so you can see the, the Christianity versus paganism theme coming through loud and clear. This idea that everything on earth is is not going to last, but heaven lasts um, and God lasts. And so you, instead of founding things on earth, founding things on friendship and kinship and money and yourself and your own self-worth, you need to found things on, on heaven and God. And this shift from a pagan society to a Christian society comes across loud and clear at the end and ties in with the theme of exile. This idea that you know, maybe the exile lives a life of exile from God in heaven and then gets to return there upon his death, um, I think comes through loud and clear too. So hopefully you get all of the themes in this poem and how they're interconnected um, and you see some of these literary terminology, uh, things, the alliteration, the kenning, the seishura, 
um, all of it at work here. Um, it's a different kind of poetry. It's a dark, it's a somber kind of poetry. And uh, I love this stuff. I think it's it's very different from anything else you run into in English class. And what's interesting is how, how true this old Anglo-Saxon code of behavior still is today. You know, all of these lessons that he teaches, uh, I think, are still lessons for being respected and, and um, appreciated as a human being. Don't whine. Think before you speak. Uh, don't always be looking to pick a fight and get angry all the time. But at the same time, you have to stand up for something. You got to believe in something. Um, you know, uh, don't be greedy. Uh, sort of a code that, that people lived by back then that, that still applies 1,500 years later. All right, I'm not going to babble. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this done and, and upload it for you, but hopefully you got something out of it. See ya.